Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to today's event, um, live from the studio with Lacey J. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Val Nivarra, and I'm the Public Programs and Residency Coordinator here at Griffin Art Projects. Uh, joining me today, we have uh, Griffin's Indigenous Marketing and Public Programs intern, Jordana George. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. They are going to be uh, helping me coordinate uh, the Q&A after Lacey's talk. But uh, before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that our work takes place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Stolo nations, to whom we are deeply grateful. As well, we would like to thank the BC Arts Council for the support of the residency program. A housekeeping note before uh, we begin today's event. If you would like to see live captions displays for today's presentation, you can enable this by selecting the CC live transcription button at the bottom of your screen. And lastly, I'll mention that there will, all, will also be a chance at the end of today's presentation for audience questions. So if at any point throughout the presentation you have a question for our presenter, please feel free to type it in the Q&A uh, box on the panel right below on your screen, and we will read it out loud. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Lacey Jane. Lacey Jane uh, Wilborn is a contemporary painter most notable for her cinematic renderings of domestic space that undulate between gesture and realism on canvas. Originally from Treaty 6 territory of Edmonton, Alberta, Wilborn studied fine arts at the University of Grand McGowan in Edmonton in 2009, received her BFA between Concordia University in Montreal and the School of Fine Arts in Bordeaux. France in uh, 2016, and obtained her MFA from Emily Card University of Art and Design in 2022. Now based in the Coast Salish territories of the Pacific Coast, Wilbur gratefully dedicates her time to painting, teaching, and scuba diving. Lacey, please join us. Hello. Hi, can you all see and hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for that introduction and that land acknowledgement. Um, I'm just going to launch in then to uh, a bit of a presentation about my work before I show what I've been doing um, over here at Griffin. Um, oh, it says it's paused. Why is it I'm working? Share screen. Can anybody see that? What, what do you see? I don't see anything. Do you guys see the slideshow? No, 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 we cannot see it. It just says uh, Lacey Jane has started the screen. Yeah, weird. It was working just a It was bit. working a little bit ago. Yeah, oh, I love technology. So great, all the time. Okay, um, my apologies for this. I'll see what is happening now. Weird, okie dokie. Something <laughs> Let's try this yeah. one more time. Do you want to maybe stop sharing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, then... I'll stop and I'll just see if I can come back in there. Um, I love this. How many years we've been doing Zoom and <laughs> <laughs> this still happens all the time. Okay. Okay, let's go third time. Awesome, we're it's seeing it now. Working. Yay, success. Yeah. My apologies everybody for that. Um, I am not very technologically savvy. I'm a painter and don't really think it's gonna get any better at this point, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, so as Fauna mentioned, um, I am a uh, primarily a painter. I'm both an oil painter as well as a muralist. Um, my work has always been quite representational uh, throughout all of my artistic career. And um, I'm going to do this presentation. I'm just going to kind of quickly go through quite a bit of an overview of where I started um, most of my trajectory in the last couple of years, and then bringing to what I did over the last two years during my master's thesis at Emily Carr, and then what it's brought me to with this residency here um, at Griffin Art Projects. Um, so before I began my master's degree, I was really interested in portraiture. And that's what the primary um, 
range of my practice was, um, always working a lot with uh, figures and representation, but then always working with um, kind of mastering the likenesses and using the characters of my sitters to kind of be sort of a roadmap and telling a bit of a story and a bit of narrative about their lives. So most of these works were created um, between 2018 and 2020 while I was still living in Montreal. Um, as, as Fauna mentioned, I'm from Edmonton, spent a couple of years traveling around between my degrees, and then I moved to Montreal for the past, for the past 10 years before I moved to, to Vancouver in 2020. Um, so most of the subjects are people that I've met throughout my travels around the world, and then also they're people that I know. So sometimes I'm working with friends, sometimes I'm painting um, fellow artists. Uh, and with portraiture, what I was always really interested in was the capacity for narratives and letting the personality of the individual be expressed through the movement of paint. With my practice, I'm really interested in both engaging the material as much as the subject. So I'm what a lot of people like to refer to as a painter's painter. And that's, I really love the medium and I love the mode of storytelling. And I've never tried to hide evidence of the brushwork. I've never tried to be a completely photographic renderer because I really like the language of paint to have a voice on its own. Um, and then collaboratively as a muralist, I work with my best friend, Leila Folkman under the moniker Lala for Lace and Leila Art. And um, with the murals, we've also done quite a lot of portraiture because I found that they can serve a strong social commentary. And we'd often work with local people from either marginalized communities or just communities that were often overlooked. So working with the everyday and celebrating the regular people in different communities. So this is a project we did with the volunteer from the Mustard Seed uh, in Calgary a couple of years ago for Bump. Um, this is a project we did in Edmonton, working with the homeless shelter, Boyle Street Community Services, um, right next to the new Rogers Place Arena. So in the wake of massive gentrification, we were using portraits of local people as a way of instigating that culture exists within urban spaces. So with a lot of the work, it was always that um, trying to use public art and public spaces as a catalyst, and partly also just as a proposition to, spend a to spread a little bit more compassion and humanity within our dense urban environments. Um, and then also a lot of the work that we've done um, is working with the elderly as well, because I find particularly in Western society, elderly people tend to lose their agency, which I find quite tragic. Um, this one in particular is actually my grandfather, Grandpa Ron. Um, this is in Kelowna we did two years ago. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to give kind of a brief overview background of where I had come from primary, um, prior to moving to Vancouver. And then I came to Vancouver in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic and as a portrait artist was told to shelter in place, to stay indoors and not talk to strangers, um, which was highly problematic because what I normally do is I work with people and a lot of the work that I create is people that I meet out in the street and in my regular life. So having um, not exactly the same medium to work with or the same mode to work with um, and lacking a bit of source material I found myself doing what I imagine a lot of us did during this time in the pandemic, which was staring at the walls of my house, because as I was sheltering indoors and in a new city and kind of separated from the world, I didn't quite know what to do or what to look for. And just out of that general innocuous boredom that kind of manifested, I feel for a lot of us, I just turned to what I had around me. And throughout this time, I was actually kind of taken by rather than feeling bored or feeling like the walls were closing in, I found the longer I looked at these spaces within my house, I actually found more to see. And I found that all of these empty vacant spaces still quite a lot spoke about humans and the presence of the figures that live within the house. So everything like in this case, an open window to me was represented the gesture of a human action. So it really felt like these houses were imbued with the sense of humans and the presence of them. So I found that really interesting as a portrait artist that all of a sudden these inanimate objects and these empty architectural spaces still spoke a lot about people. Um, and then as I was moving throughout the pandemic and sort of living you know, my own rather slow, monotonous, mundane life, I really became interested in these moments that I would trespass upon in my normal life. So rather than take painting still lives, which would be you know, a collection of arranged objects, I started letting the things that just manifested around me become my subject matter. So for instance, you know, preparing breakfast in the morning and then just coming upon it and looking at it with a different gaze saying that this is very much the reality I'm living in and it isn't loud. It doesn't have a big social context. It doesn't have this huge weight of social history of things that I want to share within public works and with this expression, it was actually a much softer value. And this idea of 
how we move through the mundane of our lives and all, all the spaces where most of our lives are actually lived, which is not in the big throes of emotions. It's not primarily between anger and love and joy and all of these crazy things that are big and really powerful, but rather a lot of our life is lived in the quiet moments of uncertainty, stress, apathy, vacancy, daydreaming, making breakfast, doing dishes, doing laundry. So this whole series uh, throughout my thesis work completely circumvented human figures, but I found it was still really interesting because it still carried so much of the weight of the moments that we live in our lives and how all of these inanimate objects began to take on a personality of their own. For instance, approaching my, fig my fridge at night for common midnight snack, just there was a, a different charge to it when I was having less human interaction. It just really felt like there was a big weight that came through. And at the time I was also doing a lot of uh, research into, um, I found uh, Gaston Bacalade's The Poetics of Space, that fantastic French philosopher who in the sixties wrote that absolutely fantastic work that really compared the domestic space and the spaces which we live into the psychological and emotional centers of the human psyche. And that was something that I really, really leaned into um, as well as Bill Bryson's At Home, which is a more colloquial style novel, or not novel rather, um, literature, that really also talked about how the human house is an archeological site and how so much of human history from all over the world ends up in these objects. And we don't necessarily know the origin, but it was really fascinating from a historical point of view to learn things such as, you know, why salt and pepper is the, the main things on the table and not cinnamon and cardamom. And that the reason that we have dining rooms in modern houses was actually because of the silk trade. So finding a lot of interest in excavating the human house for all of the things that we've carried throughout the weight of history and how globalization has affected it. And so I thought it was really powerful, sort of this, the density of information and uh, the density of history that was carried through. Um, so then this series kind of also began expanding to the long walks and long bike rides I was doing as, again, pandemic boredom. And coming from Montreal, where most of the houses are actually all apartments and walk-ups, I got really into these huge Vancouver character houses in the yards. And for the same reason that I was looking at the inside of my house with a heightened intensity, because I found it represented access and served as a bit of a portrait of myself and the things I'm curated my life around, I found the outside of houses presented a really interesting opacity in that you don't know what's going on behind these closed doors. Some of the personality spills out from sounds and the decorations and yards and the things around them. But the inside of a house is a really charged, opaque moment that doesn't really provide you access. And particularly in the pandemic, when you're not entering houses, this divide, this threshold between invitation and access became even a little bit more of a greater chasm between the two. So this, this series of excavating houses for their potential to serve as portraiture, I found worked on both the outside as well as the inside. Um, particularly, I found this really interesting at night and I've always been amazed by inhabitants that will live their life in front of a big giant glowing window at night and you can just see inside and see all of their goings on, which I always just find incredibly fascinating and that really piques a voyeuristic interest in, my, in just my regular life. And, you know, looking at these houses at night, they just sort of they began to take on a personality of themselves. And then the more I would observe them on my long bike rides around the city, the more that they just became their own living form of entity. And in the way that I paint, I really try to let the mark of the movements of the brush um, correlate to whatever the subject is or how I'm feeling about it. So in the same way that I would use brushwork and viscosity and color to represent the figures I was painting, I tried to carry that same energy to these, um, to these uh, um, architectural spaces. And then as I moved a little bit further, I began getting more interested with this idea of playing with ambiguities and working less on representing things from a really static point of view as I generally work from photographs. Um, and even this was a photograph of the pink, pink flamingos outside of my house, but playing a little bit more with this fantastical idea of what you can say in a painting that you can say in a photograph and where you can have areas of mystery and areas of confusion and areas of ambiguity. And as I experimented more with the medium of paint, I found the less bound to the photograph I became, the more space I left for the viewer to interpret and inhabit the works. And that's what's really been pushing me um, into the works that I'm doing now, which you'll see in a little bit. So this the playing around with how I can let the material speak just as loud as the actual subject matter and having sort of that 
that balance be equally weighted between the surface of the canvas and then the images that I'm presenting within the canvas. And I really find that space exciting, that stretch between the two of what can be messy and confusing and ambiguous and then what's representational that gives me a grounding or a foothold because as a representational artist, I still really like having an anchor point. That's something for me to really dig into physically to look at and to feel like it's an inhabitable space in a painting and then also leave a lot of room for interpretation moving outwards. Um, one of the other parts that I got really excited about towards the end of the thesis and which I've really been pursuing now is really leaning into darkness and partly because I spend a lot of time walking around the city at night I find there's just there's such a richness in darkness and it leaves such a sense of mystery and an ambiguity between it so really playing with how these modes of nocturnal um, feelings can come through through the paint so this has been something that I've been really leaning towards now which I've been finding really exciting so then um, as I moved on, one of the things that I've been doing more recently, this was the last work of my thesis, and instead of working with physical spaces that I was photographing within my actual life, I started moving into completely fabricated spaces and completely inventing spaces that weren't real. Because I, What I began to find is that whether or not the space I was depicting actually existed didn't matter to me quite so much. It was more about disrupting the space and how these tangible environments can become circumvented by paint, um, pushing through between color, between gestures, between movements, and creating these undulations between a physical, tangible world and a complete um, invention of paint and an intervention of paint. Um, so that's kind of what had been setting me off. So then moving here to the Griffin, uh, what I was really excited about doing here is starting a new series that really is supposed to lean in more or is trying to lean more to this idea of the movement between the planar world and then this fantastical kind of imaginative world of paint. And I had originally told myself, I've got two months here, I'm gonna just do one large painting to completion. I'll have this really nice succinct start and finish and I'll feel like a great sense of accomplishment. And that is not how I work. I am not a linear, linear thinker at all. So instead I have three large unfinished paintings. So I'll share those with you and then I'll take you kind of around the studio so you can see the mess that I'm working in and where they're going. Um, but so for this next series, I really wanted to bring the figure back into my work, but I also really wanted to keep going with this idea of interior spaces. And one of the parts of my thesis research that I really dug into really hard was the word interiority and the concept of interiority, which is the quality of being indoors or inwards. And I found that really potent territory because the idea that it's a psychological space as well as a physical space really made a lot of sense to me. So when I think about being indoors, it's a less experiential world. When I'm outside, I'm more stimulated. You have, you have the temperature, you have the weather, you have unknowns, you have extra sounds. There's just so much more stimulus going on, whether you're out in nature or in urban environments. I find there's just a lot of, um, a lot of sensory overload coming from all directions. But when I'm indoors, and especially in my house or in a comfortable space, it's where we tend to sink in, I find, or you kind of lean into things a little bit more. You, you know, you let your hair down, you let your feet up. It's a comfortable environment. And instead of focusing so much on the physical inspiration, um, sensations around you, I spend more time going inwards mentally and spending more time daydreaming and going into myself and thinking about all the things that preoccupy myself on a more psychological level and not so much a physical level. So this idea that interiority responds to both being indoors or inwards is just something I found really, really interesting, particularly as my research advanced. And I really was thinking about it in this idea of nocturnal spaces, and especially how at the end of the day, often, I'm sure many of you can relate, but we're often so tired and that's when we tend to tune out. And I got really excited about this idea that when I'm indoors and I'm at, it's the evening and I start to slow down, I find my body stops, but my mind begins to wander. And that split, that space between sort of the passive eye and the active mind just really had a slippage between the two worlds, between what I'm physically experiencing and then what I'm mentally going through. And so I really wanted this series to sort of merge that idea. So bringing figuration back in but in a really um, kind of in a, a mode of stasis. So where there's no action, there's no engagement with the viewer. It's this passive moment that's being trespassed upon by the viewer. And the series is intended to be presented in, um, I was originally thinking diptychs, but now I'm thinking it might be a series canvases in the round. 
that undulate between interior and exterior world and letting this tangible space of a figure and uh, an environment, a domestic environment, move and merge between outside space and quiet moments outside. So representing dichotomies, both inside and outside, interior mentally and interior in space, and also between the urban and the rural. So the series is having a few different modes. Um, they're all unfinished, just to preface that, but um, they're, some are more developed than others. But having this world that sort of weaves in and out between these spaces that moves between something that's a little bit more psychological and something that's a little bit more narrative as well. And I thought that was just a really interesting way to move through this idea and especially playing with the activity of the paint to really become as disruptive and maybe not chaotic, but perhaps just more organic and more fluid um, in a way that I haven't quite gotten a chance to experiment before or rather haven't. And I think this moving away from the photograph is really giving me a lot more space to do that. Um, so then working with how my interior worlds are gonna weave with these exterior worlds and all of these, all of any sort of figuration or subject matter is gonna really respond to this idea of being trespassed upon. So, um, you know, the figure, uh, the previous figure is my housemate Angie and she's wrapped up in a blanket in her most kind of interior quiet moments um, in the house at night. And then also um, looking at trail cams of wildlife, sort of that black and white flash of animals that don't realize they're being spied upon. And that interesting, that interesting space between the two about what it is when the viewer is observing something that can't, that is unaware that they're being witnessed which is why I'm, I'm really excited about this idea of building this series of paintings, almost as if it's one painting that you can move around and move between. Um, so um, playing around with kind of rearranging them as well. I'm not really sure what the final iteration will be. I'm not even sure if the one in the middle, which is the one behind me here is actually gonna be part of this series or not, but I've been really having fun playing with modular paintings that I've done them all in the same height. And so what happens when I mix the space up and how it changes the read. So that's something that I've been working on with that. So um, again, this is an unfinished work, but this is another interior space and you can't quite see it here, but when I take you on a little tour around, um, you'll be able to see a little bit more of the material qualities of the paint. Um, the only uh, other thing that I wanna mention before I kind of show you my mess is um, how much the actual environment of North Van has been feeding into this work a little bit. I hadn't really thought about it too much, but I've been spending quite a bit of time walking and biking around and spending a lot of time in the nature trails. And I didn't really realize that until I'd started painting that how much green has been an overwhelming part of this palette. And I really find that greens of the forest in particular are the ones that provide so much complexity in the darkness. Um, I grew up in the boreal forests of Alberta too. So I have an affinity for these kind of green environments, but this really wet, really earthy, and really kind of potent environment has been coming into it. And I had an artist talk, I think maybe about six months ago with um, the great Lou Shepard and Lou Shepard was talking about my paintings and they had commented how much a lot of them, the plants are taking over even when they're interior spaces. And I hadn't quite realized that, but I do love plants a lot. And I think this idea of plants breaking into man-made environments, I love because it represents a sense of decay also with human built environments, you know, no matter how bird we're being to the environment, eventually nature will um, succeed over us. And one of my favorite imagery you see in hikes is when you see those rusty trucks that are just exploding with plants around. So I think I really like bringing the uh, foliage into my paintings and it's just sort of my way of putting things back in a way that I find more harmonious. Um, so yeah, well, going around North End has been really exciting to see this. And one of the other things too, but that I really love about going with nature is that's where I try and get a lot of my color palettes from as well. Whenever I'm, cause I do love color and I find sometimes I have the tendency to use the same colors over and over. And then every time I go out in nature, I just find there's just so much, so much beautiful palettes and such harmony and such boldness that I doesn't, wouldn't necessarily put together on my own. So it's been really lovely just to go and spend some time slowed down in nature in these great environments and just seeing how much color comes through. Um, the other thing about green that I didn't really realize, oops, sorry, I'm kicking things, um, that I didn't fully realize was affecting my palette quite so much is I'm also a cold water scuba diver. And for anyone that dives in the Howe Sound and this area of the Pacific Northwest, our oceans aren't that bright blue you see in tropical environments. They're green and they're dark and they're murky. 
And there's, it's a different way of scuba diving because you have to get really close and really low under things. So there's more of an investigative quality of diving instead of when I'm be in the tropics and I just sort of float around and look each way and you can see amazing things is we really have to get into the rocks and go into crevices and move around these spaces. And you're in a world of green and it's green that often has poor visibility, but so much to find. And it only gets, it, it only becomes apparent the closer you get because when our visibility is quite poor in the water, something like the big Annapolis wreck here is gonna look really murky and almost invisible at times. And then as you get closer, closer it reveals itself. And I think that's part of the reason that I've been so interested with playing with darkness in my paintings lately is there's this reveal, there's this, not everything's being presented to you right away and you have to get a bit closer to it. Um, so that's uh, what I wanted to share about the practice and where I'm at. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then I guess I'll walk you around here for a couple minutes before questions, just if anyone wants to see. Um, this might be awkward because I'm using a laptop. So anyway, this is, this is my uh, desk area, which I've been told is quite tidy, but I think it's quite messy, but this is where all the crap lives. Um, I am a big fan of keeping photograph uh, references and inspiration nearby. And there's a great arsenal of books here and some I've brought myself. So it's really lovely just to flip through and see how some of my favorite painters have handled similar problems and how they've approached um, some of the questions that I've been approaching. And then this is a five foot square painting of um, my living room. And hopefully you can see this. I'm not sure how great my camera quality is up close, but my works are getting quite a lot more textural, which I've been finding really exciting. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm just a big lover of paint and I really love what the medium can offer and how it can come alive in the action of applying it as well as the color. So that's this painting. I just realized as I'm showing you this on my laptop, it may be backwards. Um, I'll find out when I watch the recording, I guess. Um, and then these two uh, unfinished works, which are definitely gonna be part of the same series together. Um, apologies for the, the beautiful light that's kind of dissecting this painting right now, but hopefully you can get a chance to kind of see what's happening with this one. Um, so generally with all of my paintings, I use a really bright undercolor as well, which I love to leave through because I really like to play with the textures. So having thin and then thick, so having moments where the linen is still visible and then moments where the painting is just sort of jumping off of the space. And then this unfinished one um, as well. So the first interior figurative one. So this is my housemate Angie, <laughs> um, who is the queen of sitting in this chair and completely zoning out. And I just thought it was just such a great representation of what I wanted to talk about when I talked about the passive mind and the active, or sorry, the passive eye and the active mind. Um, yeah, so that's the space at the Griffin. Um, it's been a lovely space to work in. I'm gonna be very sad when I have to downgrade to a much smaller area. Perhaps that's why I started to do three large paintings instead of just focusing on one because I had the opportunity to space. Um, yeah, so I would love uh, to answer any questions anybody might have. Awesome. Thank you so much for your presentation and for showing us around your studio space. Um, yeah, as you said, uh, we are not uh, open for questions. So if anyone has a question, they can use the Q&A or they can also un uh, raise their hand and I can unmute you. Uh, just a heads up that if you decide to do that, your voice will be recorded. Uh, so just so you know. And uh, yeah, I would like to invite your Dana to join me to moderate the Q&A. And um, Lacey, maybe uh, while folks are typing out their questions, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you did with uh, Griffin and uh, uh, Artists for Kids? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so sorry, I should have probably included that. But yeah, part of this residency was also the educational outreach residency, um, which is really fun because I'm quite new to teaching, which is exciting. I've been teaching at Emily Carr for the past two semesters. And with this residency came an opportunity to work with high school students um, from Art for Kids and also a small workshop with the Centennial Secondary School, which was really a great lesson in education because I forgot how quick high school classes are. So they're a blitz hour. So I did uh, workshops with students. And um, so my background, as I mentioned, is in portraiture work. So I wanted to show them how to work um, with kind of expressive portraiture. So I have a little army of 
little uh, portraits that I'd done on UPO, UPO paper um, towards the end of my degree. And then, so this workshop with high school students, I kind of walked them through how I do a more expressive style of portraiture and um, letting them do um, whatever they felt like. We were all working from photographs, but I walked them through how I approach portrait painting. So I've met with them, we did a workshop together and then I've met with them twice more and the Art for Kids program is gonna be actually having the first exhibit in January, I believe, Fana, yeah, January here at Griffin Art Projects, so the gallery downstairs. Um, so there'll be about 25 works by high school students which are really engaged in painting, which is really awesome to see. Yeah. Oh, that's very exciting. And um, Lisa has uh, made a question. Uh, you can see it in the chat box. Uh, not in the Q&A, but in the chat one. And I'm going to read it out loud for captioning purposes, but you can also read it from there. So it says, hi, Lisa. Jane, I wonder if you might like to talk about your historical painting references. Are there any key painters from earlier moments in painting history that you see as informing your work? Yes, Lisa knows that this is a question I love answering. I am a art history buff, um, particularly 19th century realism, primarily coming out of France. And um, I think I'm glad I mentioned some of the work we do with um, murals because I think it'll correlate a little bit more. So um, for those who may be quite not as familiar, um, 19th century realism was a really powerful movement because it was one of the first times throughout painting history that people or artists started depicting the realities of lived life and particularly the working class, poverty, um, the harder parts of life. So through a lot of classical painting, it was a lot of big, gorgeous works about Greek mythology, Christian mythology, um, talking about nobles and kings and kind of presenting morality paintings. And then when, uh, after the revolution in France, there was sort of this movement to depict life as it really was. So there was a lot of romantic paintings of the rural life. And then the realist painters came along and they started showing the real, what it really was. So showing poverty, showing um, fields that had nothing to, that weren't sowing grains and showing, um, you know, harsh realities, whether it was uh, women that were sex workers, whether it was children that were on the streets. And there was a rawness and an authenticity that I really loved. And I really, really got into it. So looking at the way that a uh, great French painter, Gustave Courbet, would paint a dead trout or a drunk neighbor or a sex worker with the same love and attention that was given to kings and given to nobles and given to, you know, mythical creatures. And that just really touched something um, for me for just that love of authenticity and talking about what real life is. And so social realism, I still would consider what I do now, even though I'm not doing so much figuration, I'd still consider this social realism. It's just a much quieter, softer value. I'm talking about the spaces, psychological spaces of indoors. Um, but when it comes to, um, yeah, for it, painting influences, there's so many, I could go on and on and on. Um, I really love uh, both John Singer Sargent and Cecilia Beau for the way that they had such a mastery of both pre presenting portraiture work, but there was a lightness and an airiness. But when you go up close, these paints were just gobbed on. Same with Diego Velazquez. He just had this, you'd see a highlight on a gown or a ruff of a coat and you go up close and it's this huge gob of lead white paint. So it was that wonderful reveal between looking at these wonderful spaces and coming up close. Um, um, uh, Soreo by, um, uh, in France, um, he was walking Soreo. He's another great influence. He really worked outside a lot and was a movement of light. So a lot of the painters that I really love talked about things that I found really valuable, but there's also the way in which they handled the paint. And I think that's still what I'm trying to navigate between as well, having the subject matter being as integral as the application itself. And so what, the medium says and then what the artist can say and where those mirror. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, we have quite a few questions now in the Q&A box. So I'll just read the first one uh, from an anonymous attendee. Thank you for your very clear presentation. The concepts of your work has changed so much over a short period of time. Do you see your newly imagined interior spaces circling back to working directly with the elderly again? Uh, yeah, actually, that's a really great question. Um, I hadn't really thought of it quite in that way, but there is actually a, a painting that I had started and it's currently in timeout, which is something I do when a painting's not going so well. I, I put it in its naughty closet for a while until it thinks about what it did. Um, but there is actually one that I was working on and it was, again, it was after I had done the mural with my grandfather and I particularly noticed when I spent time with him, um, especially after I couldn't see him for a year and a half, 
And he, you know, he's moved into a smaller apartment, these elderly apartments they tend to move into. And so the mementos and all of the objects that he carries his life with have been pared down more. So there's less space. And so there's, you know, like, like one of those kind of trinket cabinets that has like a couple ceramic, uh, like animals and a couple of key photographs. And it was just a really interesting way at looking at how an entire life of, you know, 80 plus years can get slowly condensed down to a few important objects and how how weighted they become and how nostalgic they are and how much attached to lived experience they are. And so that was something that I found really potent was that particularly I think for elderly people as their, their, their social world tends to shrink a little bit more and that's just by nature of mobility generally, but especially with the pandemic when you really couldn't go out. My grandfather was saying for a year and a half, he couldn't have visitors and how tough that was when you're in the twilight of your life and the golden years of your life. So I found, if anything, I found there was almost more potency between the objects and the spaces around them. And one of my dear friends, Gemma, also when I work, was working on this painting, she had commented on how these elderly apartments to have like a really upsetting temporarity to them. They feel like hotel rooms. They feel like places that you're not meant to dig into and last a long time. And that was actually really, really tragic, but also really potent territory as well. So how these these domestic spaces when you do move into some of these apartments they just have that sensation of they don't really expect you to um, really put your own decorations in and really change the walls whereas every time I move to a new place I paint I'll change walls I'll move things around and it becomes more of a you have you're allowed to put less of your own personality in these rooms so I mean I also have a real aversion to these elderly apartments those, those assisted living things they just make me quite sad because I don't like that I love mess I love chaos I want people to have houses exploding with junk and personality um, but yeah that's a really interesting question I don't know necessarily that that would become my sole focus but I think that would definitely be something I touch upon for sure um, the next one isn't actually a question it's just a comment um, from another anonymous attendee and they just wanted to share um, a link to the work of Marilyn McAvoy and her paintings, just saying that you might enjoy them if you're not familiar with them. Thank you. I'll put that in my notes here. Um, and then the next one is from Landon McKenzie. And they say, thanks, Lacey. The new paintings at Griffin look great. As the one, as the one of the female figure, it can be read multiple ways. It looks as much as if a woman is huddled in the rain in the downtown east side under neon, as a dreamy artist curled in a Vancouver living room. How do you reconcile the way paintings can be read against your intentions while embracing this as one of the gifts of painting to not have fixed meanings? Big hugs from Landon. Thanks, Landon. Um, that's a really great question and I'm really excited to hear that correlation. I think what you said in the second half is exactly that. I think that that ambiguity and that openness for interpretation is rich territory. And I don't really have any intentions of forcing that, that read. I think that is that what's really exciting about painting is that it's gonna be read in different ways and it's gonna come across differently. And I think that correlation between the two very, very different environments, it still speaks very much about something about going interior and it is psychological space. And even though one has a much heavier weight than the other one, I think it's still coming across to that idea of inwards and that going into something where your mind is moving and your body isn't but I do think that that sense of not being able to steer the audience is what I'm more interested in so with some of the previous works when I found I left less space for that interpretation I was sort of presenting work and saying this is what it is and this is how you look at it and I think that stepping back a little bit as a painter and letting these flow in is actually what I am going to touch upon, but yeah, that's a really great, um, it's a really great question. And it's also a really great way of thinking about how my works can be read. So thanks, Landon. Mm -hmm. um, next question again from an anonymous attendee. They say, as a new teacher, have your teaching experiences influenced your own practice in any way? Ooh, that's a really interesting question as well. I don't know if it would have influenced the painting, but it's definitely influences the way I talk about it and the way I share it more than anything. Cause I, it's interesting as I was, I was teaching a, sort of an intro painting class last year, I wasn't teaching the way I paint because I've, I learned from a very uh, foundational classical knowledge. And then I've now began messing with my own modes. And I think that worked really, really well. So I, like to still give my students that same foundational approach that still approaches it sort of from the ground up um, for what I think is a, a really successful way of teaching how to start with realist painting. 
And then from there, whether or not they want to go complete abstraction, they want to go complete um, second, you know, going out of left field and changing the style, I still want to give them the building blocks so that if they wanted to do some of the more traditional style of works, they could. So it's interesting that I don't quite teach how I'm painting now, but then I still will show them how I've approached it. But yeah, I don't think it's necessarily affect how I'm painting, but it definitely affects the way that I think about it, the way I talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that old saying of you have to learn the rules before you can break them, right? Exactly. Yeah, it works, or at least it works yeah. for me. I'm still learning though. That's the thing I love about painting and why I think a lot of painters tend to joke that we can be elitist because I'm not done learning and I don't think I'll ever be done learning. And it, what I love about it is the, you know, as my decades go on, I'm only going to get better and better at it. Possibly, who knows, maybe I'll revert, but I like thinking that I'm just going to keep getting better at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next one asks, what struggles or challenges have you faced that surprised you in your career so far? Oh, all of them. I thought I'd get more confident as time went on. And it's, it's like language, like art is a language. And with language, when you're learning one, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Um, so I would have thought after all of these years, I would have been much clearer at it. And there was a really great quote that one of my, um, it's actually in a, um, uh, something that one of my friends told me, I can't remember if it was a podcast or not, but she talked about, it was talking about writing. And I was talking about how there's often two types of writers. One writes like an architect, and one writes like a gardener. So if you're a writer that works like an architect, you have a formula, you have a structure. And it doesn't mean there's less creativity, but you come up with your plot, you come up with your character developments, and then you can just fix it all in and then make novels in this way and pump out a lot of work. And it's great with being prolific. And then there's other writers that work more like gardeners and it's messier. And you dig in the dirt, you pull one thread and you might pull up one thing and you might go on another tangent this way. And then you create a work in a much messier organic environment. And I definitely paint like a gardener. I do not paint like an architect. Um, but another dear friend of mine from my master's degree, Stephanie Buer, she paints like an architect. And it was so amazing to us have a side by side in the studio and watch the manner in which we produce works. And it was really night and day. Her studio looked like a dentist's office and was really clean and concise. She laughed at me because I always had blue paint on my face. So, and I consider myself not a messy painter. So, but yeah, I think it's just a, it's really interesting modes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, we have just one more question in the Q&A box from an anonymous attendee. They say, thank you for your talk. Can you see your paintings being translated into other media, thinking about photo and the use of light? I think possibly, I think it's more so be, they're translated from photo. So maybe that's kind of where it comes across a little bit. Um, I, as I mentioned before, like I really love the language of paint and that doesn't mean I don't love other materials. I'd love to have more time and dive into working with installation and ceramics. That's something that I really like to touch upon. Um, I have ha often got lots of people talk about how my paintings are quite cinematic and it's sort of a rather snarky, cute comment. Somebody gave once was like, well, if you like cinema so much, why don't you make movies? And it was, I just laugh because it's like, I have zero interest in making movies. I have an interest in paint. Um, but what I really love about painting is something that African Amer uh, American painter, Jennifer Packer said, where she said, she was referring to um, all of these ideas. And she said, it's a space that can only be fit in a painting. And I thought that was really potent. Just this idea that even though it's a two dimensional surface and it's only made with basically pigment and binder, it's just liquid with you know dirt essentially in it and synthetic pigments and uh, minerals. But this idea that there's so much that can go into a painting, even though it is just, you know, generally these rectangular spaces. And I just thought that was such rich territory. And I really responded to that, that there's so much I can put in a painting. And I am a big lover of all forms of art. I always find literature is the most, um, it's the most intimate because you spend, you know, nine to 13 hours with a book and you're in that artist's mind and they're walking you through it, but they're walking you through every step of the way. Same with music is such a sensorial experience. And I find it just touches something deep inside. And it's that feeling that just makes us want to move. And that's the power that music has. What I find really interesting about painting is you look at it so quickly. You often will spend, some people spend 30 seconds with a painting. So you don't have that duration that you get with literature. You don't have that visceral response necessarily that's automatic with music. But because it's such a flashpoint that I find there's a lot of nuances that you, if you don't take the time with you miss and a lot can be lost. And I think that's really exciting too, that there's paintings I find are more ambiguous because you're not being, you're not having your hand held the whole way through the journey of the story. You choose what to take in and you choose what to leave behind. And I find that really interesting. But um, yeah, I, I definitely could see my paintings kind of crossing over into other realms, but I think I'm still, 
still so much in the learning process that I don't think I'm going to be giving myself space to branch out quite yet. But I do love taking photos. I take photos all the time. Um, I wish I could play instruments. I've tried. That didn't go so well. But, um, but yeah, I just, I find that I love art when it comes together. And I think but bringing these things together, I think that's why I like working collaboratively. And I think more than my paintings going into other mediums, I think I'd be rather bringing other artists into uh, my circle for presentations in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, I lied when I said that was the last question. They're still coming in. Um, Anonymous says, your murals are stunning. Where are some ideal places you'd like to situate your paintings, apart from galleries and museums, etc.? Hmm. That's a really interesting question because it's hard to think of them outside of that. And I think what I love about the mural work is that it is in public spaces and it is these kind of anti-institutional environments. So they're free, they're accessible, they give an immediacy to that. And then galleries are very much closed boxes. And I mean, I love galleries, but I still find that a lot of the friends of mine and, and people I know that aren't in the art world quite so much don't take the time to go as much. So I don't think it's that I'd wanna move my paintings so much as I think that I'd like to change the framework of galleries or have at least these kind of different spaces that are more accessible to people that don't feel quite so white cube. Um, I don't know the answer, the solution for that, however, um, which is why I think talking to curators is great because the more I meet, the more they tell me about alternative spaces that they've come up with. And I think that's fantastic. And it's just not an area that I've considered or researched enough myself. Um, but it's something that I'd love to hear more suggestions on because I do think it'd be really interesting to see the ways in which we move art more out into the public sphere or bring the public in closer engagement with art. Yeah, I agree. That's a really interesting space to explore. Um, another anonymous attendee says, are you able to talk some more about your use of paint and creating more textural works? Yeah. Um, I'm um, definitely, so I've, I've always been a bit of a paint nerd, so I really pay attention to, I make my own mediums, so I really pay attention to fat over lean, which is a really um, important process if you're working with oil paints, um, so that's something that I always teach my students as well, so I just keep a lot of track of what I do, but generally with everything that I do is I start with a really thin, bright wash of some sort of color, so for instance with uh, the howling coyote, um, I started with sort of this really toxic yellow underpainting. And with some of the other works I've shown in the slides, I usually do a different color for each one, but I'll have sort of a hot orange that was under the fridge. I had this kind of hot pink that was under the blue house, the little pale blue house. Um, and then so working with sort of these ridiculously bold interventions of color, then I find as I start doing the drawing, because I just sketch loosely with um, a brush that I've kind of thinned down the oil paint with enough solvent that it's almost like a watercolor. As you can tell, I'm not a huge fan of straight lines. I like really organic, messy environments. And so by doing sort of a loose sketch all over, then I, I, I do follow the traditional rules. I generally do dark to light background to front, um, but thin washes with the darks so and the first layers and then building up with color. And as it gets more to the foreground and as it gets lighter, getting thicker and thicker and thicker, I've found it takes for me quite a bit of bravery in the newer works to really lay it on thick. And a lot of my paintings, if you look at the sides, they are quite thick, but they're thick kind of all over. So you don't quite notice that sculptural um, pastoness so much. So it's been a bit of an active um, process to remember to really pile the paint on and to really let it go through. I mean, I go through a ton of paint, I'm not um, economic when it comes to what I use. So basically the only paints that I use are these gigantic honking tubes that I buy and I go through them. I usually have to buy that lot over every year because um, I'm not afraid of just really piling it on. Oh, I don't have a mixed palette. I could have showed you a mixed palette. Um, but yeah, working a lot with like, I find big tools make it easy. So like, this is one of my palette knives that I use when I start with under layers. Um, big fan of like having honky brushes. This is what I tell my students too, is that your brushes are your vocabulary. So the more brushes you have and the more sizes of them, I find that gives you just more language to work with when it comes to painting, at least for me, especially when you're working large. Um, so yeah, so then, oops. then uh, yeah, I think it's a, uh, it is a lot of trial and error. When I do my uh, studio paintings, they take way longer than the mural paintings because the mural paintings I'm working collaboratively and we have a clear plan, a clear trajectory. And this is a lot of, as I said, that gardener style of painting. So it's putting things on, realizing they're a mess, scraping them off. Um, I don't know if you can tell in the one of the figures sitting there, but she's 
she's there's like kind of a ghost of her behind because two days ago or three days ago I decided to completely repaint her and I moved her down and over about eight inches um and clearly on my um the curator in residence next to me was laughing at me being like you just already painted this thing why are you moving it I was like this is actually a really common part of my practice I constantly repaint things and move them around so if you ever took an x-ray to my paintings you're going to see like five other paintings underneath um but yeah it's it's I I like that whole good writing is rewriting good painting is repainting so it's a constant process of adding it's a lot of mental gymnastics and I don't always have but usually what I come up with is nothing what I imagined it would be at the beginning thank mm -hmm. you so much Lacey for uh like all the amazing things that you just shared with us and um like I really enjoyed uh, not only hearing you right now, but also when uh, you had uh, students visiting you at your uh, studio uh, and you talking about like all this, uh, like layers and, and how you work. I really appreciate the metaphor about the gardener and uh, your gardening approach to painting and repainting. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, today. Thank you, uh, all of you. In, um, Oh, okay. Well, there's a last question. Should we do it? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, there's an anonymous attendee question, and it's a two-part question. And they ask, now that you no longer student, how has your thinking around research changed, if at all? And do you have advice for students living in a complicated contemporary world? I wish think I need advice for living in a complicated contemporary <laughs> world. Um, great questions, though. So, yeah, definitely my um, idea around research has changed. I actually really find a lot of validity in it. And because um, at first, when I started a master's degree, I was just thinking, like, what the hell is art research? It didn't quite make sense to me until it's actually Lisa. Great, um, it's a really great ways of thinking about it. And it was this idea of talking about um, like it's you know critical inquiry and what you're interested in and who you're comparing yourself to because I thought of research from a, a more scientific approach where you're doing experiments and you have to have results and you need to you know have hypotheses and test them and I thought that didn't quite correlate to painting and then I realized how much it does just in a really different environment and you're not looking for a solution you're more looking for what the questions you're asking are so I do find that having gone through the master's degree and now research is a really interesting part of my work but a lot of research is coming from engaging myself with the rhetoric of what other artists are doing how are they approaching the same topics and I love reading too so then when I find new articles about new ideas and new concepts and listening to podcasts about artists I find it's just really rich territory to find where they're coming from and having rather than just painting arbitrarily but painting things I'm really interested in and navigating is actually coming through and helping me find things that I really want to say with painting you know why am I contributing to a world that already has so much garbage in it and you know why am I just making more things but that's just how I process information I'm a maker and I'm a project-based person and I find by diving into my own research it's really helping me facilitate exactly what it is that I'm interested in sharing it in a visual way as far as advice for students living in a complicated world um, go outside more <laughs> drink water I don't know <laughs> it's um it's just one of those things life life is really complicated but I find nature is very life-giving um scuba diving scuba diving is fantastic it's the best way to turn my mind chatter off um but yeah i think laugh a lot take time for yourself live life travel all the things that i've done and i love to do is just live a really big loud life thank you um and yeah maybe that's the perfect way to wrap it up and uh yeah thank you once more and thank you everyone else for joining us here today for uh live from the studio with Lacey jane we hope to see you at our next event uh, which is remix history film series this is screening uh with a director q a to follow i'm gonna put the link of the event on the chat box if you want to register for that. And lastly, a reminder that our gallery at Griffin Art Projects has in exhibition stand Douglas, Allegories of the Present. We are open Friday through Sunday, noon to 5 p.m. And if you like, if, and if you would like to know more about uh, Griffin Art Projects and the uh, public programming that we have, I'm gonna drop in the chat uh, the website for Griffin and right at the end of the website you can subscribe to our newsletter and we would love to hear from you so thank you everyone thank you Jordana thank you uh Lacey uh I hope you have a nice uh afternoon thank you thank you Thanks, bye, Lacey. bye.